Good morning, everyone. We're just giving it another moment for anyone who's um, kind of running a moment late, and then we'll go ahead and get started. We should actually say while we're kind of waiting to get things set, since this session we're going to be talking about um, setting classroom norms during remote learning. If any of you have some examples, maybe that you worked on kind of developing and used with your students, we we'll definitely will have some time towards the end. We have samples from uh, teachers that we're going to share, but if you have samples as well, I think I mean, the more the merrier. I think everybody seems like they really enjoy seeing what other people are doing and how they're working through this. And I think we'll get some of the some of the back end of how to maybe rethink and set those norms. But if you have something now that you've been using, or if you have a colleague that shared something that you think would be useful for other people to see, I think we're definitely going to be looking for some of those examples later on in this session. All right, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Emma Banks. I am the Secondary Digital Learning and Computer Science Specialist. Um, I see some familiar faces, so I'm glad to see some folks are returning for our sessions. Um, Co-hosting with me is John, and I'll let him introduce himself quickly before we get going. And I'm John Graham. I'm the Elementary Digital Learning Specialist at the Department of Education. Okay, so today we are completing module one of the Remote Learning 101 series. And module one has focused on setting the stage for remote learning. So the final component that we're going to discuss is establishing class norms and kind of the process of, of going through that. So one of the reasons that it's important to establish classroom norms in a virtual environment is because it has been proven that children learn and remember uh, quite a bit from the context of the classroom as well as the content. It's not just about the content, it's very much about the interaction between students, between teacher and students and the group as a whole. So the context of the classroom and kind of some of those considerations that they have to go through in the the conduct sense of things um, can be really helpful uh, skills for them moving forward. Some of the things you might want to set norms for would be uh, your virtual classroom, whether that's a learning management system or a shared file structure or, you know, depending on what your format is, you might be using Padlet or some other tool, kind of setting the norms for the different tools that you're using to host your classroom can be um, helpful. You also want to set norms for daily routines. That's kind of like where your expectations are. What are you expecting from students? How should they be um, engaging with each other? Video conferences are a big one. Um, I think that a lot of people have come up with some norms for video conferencing to try to minimize some of the distractions that end up happening. And then office hours. If you're having office hours, kind of setting the norms for that so that students can kind of know what what the purpose is and what they might, uh, how they should be expected to kind of engage with you during that time. Oh, my screen has frozen. Oh, there we go. Okay. So there are some different types of norms that you can put them in some categories. You've got safety and health norms. That's kind of where some of the you know, uh, screen time and those considerations, making sure that the socio-emotional socio needs are being met and that your students are taking care of their, you know, their physical beings as well as their, you know, their mind, the whole mind-body emotional connection. Uh, moral norms would be kind of those, how we treat each other, the respect, those kinds of things. And then discretionary norms would be like, the items like what do you expect them to do at the at the beginning of class at the end of class those kinds of things if there are expectations surrounding that um, it can be helpful and we kind of all probably have an understanding of how these norms work in a face-to-face -face classroom but this is kind of just looking at this through the lens of remote learning and virtual learning and thinking about how these norms translate and how we might be 
really explicit with our students in kind of creating this community uh, within our classrooms where students feel feel respected and are also you know providing respect to their fellow students. Okay, so one of the most effective and practical ways to um, incorporate students in the classroom and give them kind of that feeling of belonging is to help them and allow them to participate in developing your classroom norms. Um, one of the best ways to actually get them to follow them is when they set them themselves because it's a lot easier to be like, well, you guys are the ones that kind of chose these. So, you know, you should probably be living up to what you're saying. If, whereas instead of on the, the alternate where you're developing the norms and then telling them what they should be doing with them. Um, it kind of gives the, the ownership on, onto your classroom and your, your students. So some strategies. You want to use positive language versus negative, you know, do's versus don'ts. Try to keep things like this is what you want them to do, not this is what you want them not to do. It's, you know, you want to keep it very positive focused and these are, this is how you, you know, conduct yourself in a, a positive manner in the classroom. Um, emphasizing digital citizenship and classroom safety in a virtual environment is absolutely imperative, Im imperative in your norms. Um, I think that anytime we can bring that central to the conversation in a virtual environment, it's, it's definitely a good process. Um, having a conversation about rewards and consequences, students knowing what the consequences of not meeting those norms are or what they might actually achieve if they do, besides just the satisfaction of having a, a safe and welcoming environment. Um, you wanna keep language simple and grade level appropriate um, by establishing norms with your students that will often happen organically because they will use their own words and you won't have to worry about trying to match it to their, their level of understanding. Um, so that can, that can be helpful. Um, and you want to use scaffolding for norms as well. So you can have macro, like the higher level norms, where it's like these are the general things that um, we want to make sure are happening or not happening in the classroom. And then you can have micro norms for these are the expectations surrounding, you know, the use of this tool or the use of this computer or what, whatever the, the topic might be. So you can have the higher level just classroom norms, but then you can also have the the more smaller level like okay these are the expectations for this particular moment or this task or this activity so consider using scaffolding for that purpose so that you can kind of have those higher macro and then the lower micro as well so some strategies for norm integration um, one of the things that we like to emphasize is that classroom norms cannot be static. They're not just something you write once and you put it on your wall and it's good. You should revisit them. You should integrate them into daily tasks and routines. Um, look for opportunities within your, your lessons and activities to reinforce the norms of the class. If you're having a discussion with your students and you, you realize that something relates to one of those norms, you could you know, kind of point that out to them. and. Um, again, use that narrative, you know, that you might have that internal connection, but externalize that and kind of explain that to your students that, oh, this connects to, you know, the norm that we created about this topic or about this. Um, so you want to look for those kinds of opportunities for integration. And then again, the, including students in the, the process of developing the norms, that can help with the organic integration because they will also be able to see those connections and patterns if they helped to create them. And then revisit and revise the norms list as a class. This is one of the big keys. They may not work when you first put them up, so you might have to, or not, maybe not all of them, so you might have to revisit it as a class and be like, okay, so this, it doesn't seem like this norm is aligning or it's not like we're not meeting this goal or this outcome. So what might we do as a class to kind of revisit this? Or, you know, maybe the norms, maybe you had uh, in-person norms and now you're looking at this in a remote environment. Include, the, the, include your students in that conversation and kind of ask them, how do these, you know, what, how does this translate and kind of include them in that process because then they can help to one, brainstorm and provide solutions, but also to be able to make those connections themselves as to how your in-person code of conduct or classroom norms can translate to your virtual classroom. And 
at this point, I am going to hand it off to John and he's going to talk a little bit about some examples that we have that some uh, main teachers have shared with us of their norms. So I was kind of fortunate from, um, Emma actually started in her position into um, oh, COVID-19 shutdown. So I had the luxury of having sessions from the get-go and a lot of people just kind of throwing out ideas. This is what I'm doing. This is what I'm trying. So I actually was able to collect a lot of um, different kinds of norms that people had set up and it varied widely across um, grade levels. I don't have any high school examples, so I'm definitely looking for some high school examples. And then office hours, I think, is another one I'd be really curious. So if anybody that's on here has an example that they'd wanna share, those are gonna be some ones that I'd like to look for. Um, so this first one is from Lindsay Davis um, at Leroy Smith Elementary in Winterport. And she uses Seesaw with her kids. So she actually would create a morning board like this for every day. And it was, I mean, as you can see, it's very graphic in nature. And it's very clear, hopefully, with the different things that kids want to do or will, will need to do throughout the day. So her, a lot of her design was kind of based on the regular sequence of how things would happen a regular class day. So something like morning message that she normally had the kids gather on the carpet and will look at the board and talk through it. Instead of doing it that way, it was shifting to a virtual environment. So I think that's one of the aspects to be kind of thinking. If you have norms that you were kind of doing in your classroom normally, if you can transition them, even if it's in a slightly different form to a virtual setting, that might be something to try. Just, I think, especially in terms of transition, that will be helpful for kids. Um, and then I actually, I had emailed her because I wanted a, a few more details on this. And what she did, she actually created this in Google Slides and created a, a bit.ly link. And she would share this on Seesaw out to her students. So when they got onto Seesaw, it would be, um, I think in their journal section that they'd be able to look on it and see. But also she had her parents' email list and she would email the bit.ly link out to parents so they could look at it on their smartphone as well. So just kind of something like that, putting it in a couple different places just to help with the communication and accessibility because obviously some parents are going to be right on their smartphone as opposed to being on a seesaw um, on seesaw with their kiddos on a device so I think that's one of the things to kind of keep in mind is that any of those structures that you can kind of leverage so she used seesaw a lot in her classroom so it's something being able to use that outside of the classroom was a pretty easy transition for her so I don't know if anybody has any questions about this. Oh, how do you create a bit.ly link? So bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y, um, is a free service. They do have some pay tiers, but I've only ever used the free service. Um, but you just would take the link to whatever it is you're trying to direct people towards. And what's nice about it is I mean, it does create kind of a, a link that you can use, but you can actually adjust the back end of it. So you could change it to a word or something like that, that could be a little bit easier for people to use. So that's kind of kind of the short on Bitly. Um, and if we wanna move on to the next one. Um, Zoom meetings, and I can share out this whole slideshow, but Haley from Thomaston Elementary, she had put together a whole slideshow that kind of talked about some of the protocols for a Zoom meeting. And she shared that out and her goal was to both, um, and especially being at the elementary level was for students to look at this with their parents. So parents kind of had a sense of when they're having Zoom meetings, what are some of the protocols that they're going to need? What are the expectations, you know, things around how they're dressed and um, how they're talking with one another, muting yourself when you're not talking, little things like that. 
but also just trying to set up some sort of agenda ahead of time so she could share that out so parents would kind of know what's going to be happening for the individual meetings. So I think any of that kind of communication that you can build in and kind of tie parents even in with the norms if you're work, working in a um, remote setting, I think it's gonna be very helpful. So that's some, a consideration. Obviously in the classroom, we might not really include parents in our classroom rules and norms. If they come in and they see something up on, on a board, they might look at that and they might ask about it during an open house or something. But otherwise, they're not really gonna be played into that. But in a remote learning setting, it would definitely make sense to include parents in some capacity. And that's something that we can share out after this, if people are interested in looking at Haley's example for her Zoom meeting rules. I'm gonna go on to the next one. Um, so this is from Amanda Doherty at Wyndham Primary School. And you can see on here, so she has kind of her agenda set up. She set this up for every single day. So she would be able to share this out ahead of time. So students and parents could look at that and kind of know, all right, with our class time today, with our Zoom um, time today, these are the different things that we're going to do. And I found in terms of engagement, that was really important. That if you're sharing these things out ahead of time, then kids kind of have a sense of, oh, you know, that'll be cool to get on and see who's the special guest that's going to be doing the read aloud for class. Um, or if there's a game on there. So you can see like there's boom cards on there. So different things like that. And she, the at the bottom, she kind of built in that parent time because I think Amanda's kindergarten, maybe first grade. So parents would be probably in close proximity to their kids when they're doing their Zoom session. So I think she really tried to pull them in in some form and try to communicate with them what was going on and just try to be helpful for them. And then one of the things I liked on, on this one, although this isn't wasn't as much of a problem after a few weeks, but obviously this was kind of early on the process, she had the digital fire drill notice. That was the reason I really like this one, where she was saying, you know, if something should happen and I have to shut down the meeting, kind of just explaining that situation. And I, I know for her, one of the big concerns there was parents had a lot of concerns about a Zoom meeting. So I think if you can kind of pull, you know, pull parents in as much as possible, and obviously as kids get older, you know, in high school, you're not necessarily gonna pull them in quite as much. But I think at the elementary level, that's really important that parents understand maybe how the meetings are working and what are some of the norms that are in place. Yeah, I particularly like in this example as well that she has like the, the agenda laid out. So if students are kind of feeling that jitteriness to be social, you can kind of see in the agenda, oh, there's a time scheduled for that. So they can kind of hold on, hopefully, hold on to some of that until that point. So this kind of helps to set some of those expectations for students as well. Absolutely. And I actually, it's funny, I, um, my sister-in-law is a Boy Scout troop leader. And she said, can you get on and kind of talk about this with some other troop leaders in the in the Bangor area, which I did. And that was one of the things that I'd really tried to impress upon them is that it's really important to have that agenda set up, but also your, in that case, your Boy Scouts, they're gonna wanna have some time to just chit chat and be silly. And you can get your work done up front. And then as long as they know that, you know, once it hits such and such a time, or once we get through these early parts, then you guys can have some time to, to be goofy and all that. Um, I think if kids know that, then they'll actually look forward to that. Cause they're looking, especially right now, they're looking for ways to connect. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. And if you're trying to build up a classroom culture virtually, so that's one of the things to be thinking about, you know, maybe for next year, we might have to kind of build our classroom culture in ways that are new and different. Having that kind of time built in and is, is gonna be really important so kids can kind of create those connections. And I can say at the MLTI student conference last week, we had a virtual lunchtime and kids were just on there. 
And I mean, they were having a lot of fun just chit-chatting and going back and forth, talking about things and sharing things. I mean, these were kids from across the state that were engaging with one another in that way. So that was a really cool thing to see recently. And on to our next one and our, our final one. Um, so a similar thing, um, I did have a middle school example, so hopefully this will be helpful, but just kind of setting up what are some etiquette and etiquette things to know. So this is a very, you know, very basic one. It kind of looks at a few different things to be thinking about. Actually, one of the things I really like about this is that it points to some tech support issues. And that's definitely something to be thinking about. And just remote learning overall is supplying students with some kind of basic help for tech problems that they might run into. So that's certainly a consideration to be making. And obviously these ones are specific to video conferencing, um, Google Meet in particular, but I think that's definitely a consideration that you wanna be making um, at any time is that you wanna be able to provide support for your students if they're having any sort of technology issues. It's not as easy as just sending them down to the, to the tech office to get something fixed. And it might, even like emailing that person might not be an easy option. So I think if you can kind of build in some of that norms, so that might be something in terms of an example, you might have kind of a um, norms or an SOP standards of protocol. You might have something like that set up so they understand if they have technical issues, you know, these are the people that you'd reach out if you have these types of issues, you know, maybe if it's an issue with connecting with your Google Classroom, it wouldn't make sense to reach out to the tech person because you're the one that's controlling the Google Classroom. But if they're having issues with their device, it might make more sense to reach out to your tech staff. So I think some of those things, um, in terms of thinking big picture, it's almost like you can't go too small. We talked about going from macro to micro. You really can't go too small because you want to try to have all of those things accounted for. Are there going to be things that you forget? Absolutely. I think that's part of, you know, just figuring out that process. And it's, I know when I, my first year teaching, we had to like hit the reset button several times. We're like, all right, guys, stuff's not working right now. We've got to, you know, set some new ground rules and, you know, had that classroom meeting and said, all right, we've got to change how things are working because this isn't working the way that we're having things going right now. And you might just have to do that in a virtual setting. You try to get things as set up as best you can and anticipate as much as you can. But I would say just know that there are going to be unforeseen problems and you just have to try to be as flexible as possible and then address those issues as they come up. So if you've got a new piece of technology that you're kind of needing to roll out, then you might need run into problems that you had not even anticipated. So I think that's a big thing is trying to be as flexible on it as understanding that's not necessarily something that you did wrong. You just, you can't anticipate everything that's going to go wrong in a regular classroom, let alone in a virtual classroom. So that's those also, are my examples of norms that I shared. Did you have something you wanted to add, Emma? I was just going to say, that's a great way to model for your students as well. That process of learning new technology, you know, it's not, it's not all about success. You know, sometimes things are bumpy. And I think when we can model that process, you know, they always say fail forward, you know, if anytime that we can model that process, like, oh yeah, this didn't go well, but let's, let's analyze that. Let's look at that. Let's reevaluate and see how we might make that better. I think with that translates to any type of technology at all. You know, anytime you can kind of go through that troubleshooting process with your students, it's phenomenal skill building for that, that technology understanding. And I think it does make sense in terms of forming, forming some of these norms. It does make sense to have kind of a groundwork of maybe where you would want them to go. I know, when I used to work with students around our laptop SOP, in my head, I had like a list and it's like, all right, I really wanna get them here, but we did it as a group. So part of that, if you work with your students, it was shocking how often they would get to almost every one of those parts that I wanted them to address. Sometimes you need to do a little bit of um, 
directing on one or two of them. But for the most part, they would get where you wanted them to go if you just kind of have that discussion. So I think that's something to keep in mind. Um, it is nice, I mean, if you're getting on a virtual classroom setting for the first time, I think that's one of the things that's important is maybe having a few ground rules set up ahead of time. And I'm sure we've all learned um, some hard lessons from this past year trying to get students on and engaged and obviously there are you know there are going to be technology challenges some students just not wanting to get on i saw that josh had put a thing on there students not even being awake so i mean you're gonna have definitely some of those things that are come up that are gonna come up and you just need to try to try to be as flexible and anticipate as much as you can but know that you're not going to be able to anticipate everything so I wasn't watching the chat while I was talking, so I'm not sure if I any questions came up that I wanted to to address in there, but I can um, share that Padlet link. So if people have any um, any norms that they want to share, um, we'll put the link to that Padlet. So so. Link to the Padlets in the chat. So people could certainly drop those in here. Even if you don't have one handy right now, if you want to do it at some later time, that will be helpful. Obviously, these videos are being recorded, so people will be accessing these in the future. So I think it's just nice to have some of those examples. One of the things I was telling Emma is during this time, we've seen so many like companies and education experts and stuff like that come out with advice and kind of ideas and a lot of those are really great but sometimes teachers just they want to see i want to see what somebody down the road how are they actually implementing this so i think this is a nice way that people can share something that they probably were doing or maybe their colleagues did if there was something that they had used and sharing that out so other people can see it and learn from that and actually yeah. i will put the ones that i have i can put those into that padlet as well Oh, that's a great idea. Yeah, I think that this is kind of our, um, our thought with this Padlet would be to kind of crowdsource what people are doing and be able to kind of um, brainstorm, you know, and be able to kind of look at what other people are doing and what you're doing and then see if there's any ideas that people get from that. Um, I saw a question in the chat about basically the idea of variating color and design of some of these things. I think that that's definitely a real um, a, a key to kind of keeping students attention and engaged. Um, I'm trying to find the chat. I think it was Nicole that said that. Yeah. Um, just the idea that if it looks the same, then kids like may not even look at it and read it thinking that it's the exact same thing that they saw last time. So um, if variating that the way that it looks could probably do wonders for their attention span. Well, I know like the example that I gave of Lindsay Davis's, I mean, she loves Bitmoji. So I think that can be an easy way to just kind of jazz them up a little bit and differentiate things. If you haven't used Bitmoji before, it's once you get it set up, it kind of takes a little process to make you look the way that you want you to look. But once you, once you get it set up, it's so easy to go through and find those different characters and be using those. So that's definitely a consideration to be making. And Emma, I keep joking because we're probably going to do some sort of Bitmoji later on in the summer, just because people have kind of had questions around that. Um, but the other thing to be thinking about is um, in what, um, what Lindsay had with hers was that she had at the bottom, I think, did, did, I'm trying to think at the bottom what hers is, had like a phrase on it, but she always changed that phrase, but it was like, half the slide like it was very like kind of red flag like this is a different slide like this is something very different but also with a very strong message in there that was kind of a little affirmation thing for students so i think those kinds of cues and things to include are really important Definitely. So I just put the Padlet up here because I see people are putting some things in. So I figure maybe we'll give just a minute or two, um, let people put stuff in here. And if anyone has any questions, this would be a fantastic time or suggestions, thoughts, ideas. 
Um, this is this would be a great time to kind of bring that up if you want to chime in. Or you can also feel free to write in the chat as well. We're gonna have to get some music, John. I can see it happening. It's like a little bit of background music would be great. <laughs> I know you you always want to do the Jeopardy music. Yeah, well, it, that's what's in my that's, head in these moments. That, like I literally like do do do. I'm that, like, well, Shh. that might mentally cue people to to do something. <laughs> I don't know how Jeopardy would feel about us using their music though. <laughs> Oops. And <laughs> so that would be copyright infringement. Yes, yes. <laughs> Without getting permission, I'm sure it would be. That's what I was thinking was I'd have to look up some like non-copyright music, like some copyright free stuff, which YouTube, I mean, you can really find some they call it NCS music. And it's no no copyright sounds or something like that. So Yeah. Or we could only use it for 15 seconds or something. So we better be quick. <laughs> Play it for 15 seconds and then not for five and then another 15 and then not for five. <laughs> I'm sure we could figure it out. <laughs> oh, I see a comment in the chat about how location and attire have definitely been an issue sometimes. That is interesting. That's something that you may not really think about, right? When it comes to a virtual environment is addressing like a tire and things of that nature, but it's not necessarily kind of in the back of your brain. I think when people are at home, you know, that level of comfortability can increase. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. I love this comment here. It's so hard to get them to stop talking sometimes. <laughs> that was definitely an experience that we had at the MLTI student conference. There was a lot of like chat in the chat box that I did not understand at all. So Amy wrote in the chat, that she can't tell you how many times in Facebook groups people have complained about students joining video meetings while in a store or in a car or something like that. So they're not really prepared for their class. No, you don't need to put your norms in the form of a question. You can put it however you want. You can link to something. Their um, Padlet has a whole bunch of options to how you can how you can connect with it. So. Um, you could certainly upload something or link to a URL or just copy and paste your text. Oh, <laughs> all right, my bad. That went right over my head, Phil. I'm trying to answer it like it's a serious question. All right, so. And I did put in the um, the Zoom meeting one. It's like a slideshow. I put the link to that in there. And Haley, Haley did say that people could kind of copy that and use use it in their own way. That's awesome. Yeah, that's been um, something I've seen a lot with Google Slides is people kind of sharing it with the ability for you to make a copy and adjust it however you want. That's how a lot of um, Bitmoji classrooms are being shared around. People are developing them and then sharing it out for people to make a copy. Okay, so this um, page is, a, an, uh, if you haven't joined us for a session yet, I will just let you know that we are sharing out the PowerPoint and resources that we talk about in these sessions um, at the end via email. So you will get a copy of these slides where you'll have access to all these links. So you don't have to worry about trying to uh, write down any URLs or anything like that, because it's kind of a hassle. So we figure we just share out the slide deck and um, do things that way. These are three really outstanding resources that talk about classroom norms and um, online classroom management, which um, we will talk a little bit more about classroom management in 
uh, later on in the series. I believe it's module two or three. I'd have to pull up the schedule. Um, but we will be talking more specifically about classroom management um, a little bit later on. We kind of, since this is getting set up and getting started, we kind of started with just the norms um, and then we'll move into classroom management kind of as we go. But there are, these are some really great resources. I particularly enjoyed reading the science behind classroom norming because it kind of walks you through the process of like a group and how, how um, groups function basically. Um, at any level and in any context so you can kind of look at that and then it directly applies it then to the classroom and establishing norms so that resource is really great and then um, this one down here is a little bit more of like a walkthrough of like how you might create classroom norms with your students and some strategies for that so those are some really um, very helpful resources and so We've kind of just been putting a checklist at the end of each one of these because we know that we're talking about a lot of things. So it's been helpful for us and I imagine for the group as well to kind of just round back to some of the things we've talked about at the end before we kind of wrap things up. And so um, for your establishing norms checklist, you want to decide which aspects of your class would, would benefit from developing norms. Um, that's that macro, micro, like how much scaffolding and where where would it be most beneficial for you to establish these norms? Including your students in the process of creating your norms, and revisiting and revising those norms with your students um, regularly. You know, you can determine how often that needs to be. It could be an as needed basis, or you could set it up so that you have it built into your classroom schedule that quarterly you're going to take a session and sit down and revise your classroom norms as a group and just act, you know, Find out if they're still relevant and make sure that you know there's no adjustments that need to be made. Um, then using the simple language that's grade level appropriate. Um, it's, it's an interesting challenge in a virtual environment because you want to be as explicit as possible and almost over explain things, but you also want to keep it as simple as possible. So it's a very fine line to ride, but I think one of the things one of the strategies to use that is most effective is to try to be succinct and try to use, uh, I want to say like as few words as possible to explain as much as possible. The more that you can convey in as least words as possible is definitely your best bet because as we all know, when you're faced with a page full of text, it can be daunting to try to actually read through it and, you know, absorb all that information. Um, it's one of the reasons that we like to suggest using visual representations that's uh, most of the examples that john shared with us were you know visual representations but they shared quite a bit of information in them um, so if you can use an infographic or a poster or you know make a google slide and kind of try to visually represent the information that you're trying to convey as well as you know using text so that you're kind of having that double effect of understanding john did you have something you wanted to add to that well, you kind of got with the visual representation piece of that. And I guess if, I mean, that's certainly something we can kind of put that question out here. If people feel like they think it would be useful to learn some tools specifically with that in mind, that's definitely something I think we could offer down the road. But yeah, I think having simple, simple language, I think if you're not meeting with students and going through kind of your list, you might not have the benefit of kind of unpacking what each one means. I think if you have students there, that's another thing, if they're part of the process, I think it's a little bit easier to break it down and make it more simple for them because they've been part of the process. So they'll kind of hopefully get what you're, get what you're getting at with your, your list. Yes, definitely. That can be kind of, it, I feel like that can be the most organic way to make sure that the language is simple and grade level appropriate is to just kind of have them develop it in some ways. I think um, one of the things that you mentioned, John, that I think is fantastic is the idea that you, you might have an end goal in mind and then it's just facilitating your group towards that direction so that they come to it on their own. So they feel that sense of ownership. Well, you've set the ultimate goal that you're kind of guiding them towards. I think it's just like, you know, a reading prompt. So, you know, you might have a, a passage that they read and then you talk about it, but then eventually you kind of guide them to the main point that you're trying to have them understand. So I think that's a really 
great way to do that. Or it's that student that when they uh, they make a comment or try to answer a question, they're completely off base and you try to carefully redirect what they've said to it seeming correct in some way. Right. Many, many teachers I've seen have that skill for sure. So I see some comments in the chat. Uh, Margaret said, we can start with simple language and gradually add new words and phrases to it so that the kids you know, can understand and build that scaffolding as you go. I think that's a great suggestion. And Amy says that some of the norms need to come from school admin, like start and end of the virtual school day and whether or not teachers are available after hours, so to say. Yep. And I think that those are great, great points that definitely, sometimes your norms can't come only from you. You kind of have to start with these basic level things and then move into some of your more classroom specific norms. And it's important to work with administration just to maybe have some consistency across classes. You know, the more you can, have those consistent norms, the fewer problems that you're gonna run into where, well, so-and-so doesn't do things that way. And obviously we see that so much in you know, a brick and mortar school setup. So you can imagine in a virtual setting, people are even more siloed. Yeah, so having that common language is, is super important. I think, I think especially if you're on similar platforms, you know, if you have your, if your whole school is on Google Classroom, then it would probably be good to have some common norms that all classes, you know, align with and then have your own like specific classroom based norms would be great. Yeah. Um, so the last thing on this checklist is just this idea of integration, integrating these norms into classroom discussions, activities, daily tasks, just anytime that you can have it kind of show up organically and reemphasize that piece is always a great idea because then you're not it's not out of context it's not just hey you know remember these things it's hey we're talking about this and this actually relates to this norm that we follow as our class or you know hey we're, we're gonna have this activity which is gonna highlight this norm that we are you know kind of working through as a class so um, integrating those norms into stuff that you're doing on a daily basis is definitely one of the best ways to kind of have it not feel as prescribed as what sometimes these kinds of things can feel in a classroom. And so those are kind of just some basic things to keep in mind um, for remote learning and class norms kind of as they go together. Um, and at this point, I think we're gonna kind of just pause and see if anyone has any questions or thoughts that they wanna share, um, suggestions, anything like that. I just wanna open the floor. Oh yes, Eunice wrote in the chat and said, a norm for teachers not to take pictures of Zoom meetings and post them in social media. I think that's something that we've actually seen, um, John and I in particular, because we've done some office hours for video conferencing and that has been um, a real concern because you can lock your meeting down as much as you want, but if somebody's taking a picture of their computer screen and posting it, then it's still um, a privacy vulnerability. So, um, emphasizing the importance that the class stays within the class you know unless you have those media releases and things of that nature then you know you really it, it's really important to emphasize that for sure and i think we saw really early on and again i i don't think we can make this point enough that our goal for this series is to kind of prepare people for remote learning in like an ideal setting what happened in march was not an ideal setting that was not the best version of remote learning so I think there are things that we can learn from that. And certainly there were a lot of changes that people were making on the fly. And I think hopefully from some of those lessons, we can get at something like, I don't think people were taking pictures and posting their class on social media, you know, maliciously. I think that was something that I saw a lot of parents do that. And they were just excited. They're like, oh my gosh, this is so great that my kid's connecting still with his teacher with his peers and stuff like that and then once you just say to them oh I, you might not really be thinking of this but this is kind of like a ferpa issue that you might not be considering then they'd say oh yeah i hadn't even thought about that so i think those kinds of conversations and points we can have some of those conversations now and over the summer and that will make things much easier in the fall instead of people being 
reactionary. I know once Zoom bombing became a thing, some school districts were just like, nope, we're not doing any more Zooms at all. And I think for other schools, they're just like, well, we have to, you know, we'll have to offer this, but we've just got to try to figure things out. Um, so certainly one of the benefits we have for the summer is that we can plan on whatever the fall is going to bring. So if it's, you know, remote learning as we're doing it right now, then we can, you know, have that time to plan for it and hopefully it will be, you know, be more effective, be better thought out and be better planned. If it's, you know, we're pivoting or we have to, you know, go back to school and have to step out, you know, hopefully we've made some plan so we can do that more effectively. So I see a question from Gordon in the in the chat. Since we'll be dealing with a whole new group of students, thoughts on starting the year aside from the classroom meetings? And I would definitely say, Gordon, that that's, that's a huge question right now. And obviously, you know, best case scenario, we'd all be back. And even if we had to leave, we'd be able to go and kind of make those initial connections. But I think people are trying to, again, make those plans. So if you're, we're not able to go in and be meeting, what are mechanisms that we can put in place so kids can make those connections with one another, with their teacher? Um, especially, I mean, I, where I sit on the early learning team at the DOE, I mean, thinking about pre-K and kindergarten, it's so, so important. And I think for a lot of parents, that would just be, you know, really nerve wracking that like my kid's starting kindergarten and they're not even able to go to school. How are they, like, how is this going to work? Um, and I think also at the high school level, it's certainly something those kids at that level, they have all kinds of new teachers that they're wanting to, you know, what's what's the deal with this teacher if they haven't had them before and kind of figure out figure out their class figure out who their peers are and and all of that so it's i mean it, it's it's important across the board and i think people are going to be trying to figure out what are the best things mechanisms that we can put in place to help with making some of those connections and i mean they're going to they're going to need to be things both big and small there's not going to be one one size fit, fits all for this scenario. So it's going to be, you know, students, you know, maybe making videos to introduce themselves and sharing it so other people in the class can watch them. Maybe it's having a virtual class time where you just go around and do introductions. Maybe it's um, setting up a Bitmoji classroom where you're able to have kids make their Bitmoji and share it and you have that virtual classroom space. And I've heard of a lot of different ideas and obviously there's no one that's going to work for everybody. I think it's kind of just a matter of people hopefully investing in a few different things and trying to find which one will work best for them. Yeah, another strategy that I've been hearing um, quite a bit is the idea of trying to get your new class list um, kind of sooner rather than later and making connection before the beginning of school, um, potentially even making connection with the teacher who your students are going to be coming from to help like create a warm handoff. Um, so anything like that, you know, sometimes it's possible, sometimes it's not. Sometimes teachers don't know who their class, their class of kids is going to be until two days before the beginning of the school year. So, um, you know, it really depends on kind of how the structure of your district is working out and what kind of information you can get access to. But um, those are some strategies that we have been hearing about um, trying to prepare for the fall. And you would have the benefit, I mean, like right now, it's fantastic that we can see many people's faces and see their names and you can start making those connections. So I think that's something to kind of keep in mind. You have that benefit that when you're meeting with groups of people, it's easier to remember people's names. And for kids, I mean, knowing other people's names, I mean, there's a lot of power there. I know for, and for any teacher, I'm sure they'd say, you know, the quicker you can know who your kids are and know their names, like the better off you'll be. Yes, definitely. Um, I want to point out, Phil mentioned something that I feel like is very important in remote learning right now. And that's the idea of um, setting up some expectations and standards surrounding breaks. You know, you kind of have to build breaks into um, a virtual 
work and learning environment. I think we probably have all learned this lesson the hard way. Like just because you're sitting at your computer, you know, three to four to four to five doesn't mean that you necessarily want to schedule a three to four and then a four to five, because then even in a, a face to face environment, you would usually have that transition time. You would leave yourself like 10 minutes to go to the bathroom, grab a snack, whatever. So trying to like emphasize that in, a remote environment can be really helpful. I know that I have had to do that myself is just remind myself, okay, I actually need five minutes so I can go make a coffee before my next meeting. You know, those kinds of things can be an absolute lifesaver on the fatigue that you end up experiencing in this environment. Okay, so I see um, Kelly is asking if there are some examples of Bitmoji classrooms that people have made. I have um, one example that I will pull up in a moment and I'll drop it into the chat. Um, the example that I have is kind of like a, a slideshow that you can go through to create your own Bitmoji classroom. So it's kind of like almost a walkthrough and it's got some links to some helpful um, places where you can get like objects and things of that nature. So I'll toss that in um, in just a minute. And it looks like John's working on something as well. So. I I, I mean, I know that I have teachers that I've kind of talked with that they've made things, especially elementary level people that use Seesaw. I mean, Bitmoji is pretty common there. So there are definitely some people that I want to pull, pull in and get some of their samples and see what they're doing. But I think that's just, I would stay tuned for that because I think we probably are going to have something. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think we're probably gonna be doing like a whole session on Bitmoji <laughs> because every time it gets brought up, there's like more and more interest in it. So I think that that's something that's definitely coming. Um, okay, so I see a question. Um, can you post a link to past trainings on specific programs? Yes, I can drop that in. They are on the DOE website. Um, none of the Remote Learning 101 are there yet. I'm hoping to get them up tomorrow, but um, look for those next week but the ones that we've done prior, like of, of Google Classroom, Seesaw, things of that nature, those are already posted and I can drop the link in there. Um, and then I see um, Jessica asked, it, there's her, teach, her daughter's teacher has virtual shares where there's a question and kids video their response and share them to the class, um, asking like, what, what's your favorite? What are some project activities that you've been doing? What's something that you're good at, et cetera? Um, so that's, that's a pretty cool strategy. Um, okay, I'm gonna grab those links real quick. Well, and Jessica, I was kind of thinking of something like that is students will have the benefit of, you know, of the summertime if you're able to make some of those connections. I mean, using an app like Flipgrid where they're able to record themselves, kids within a class could watch one another's videos. Um, and really they could record themselves doing something. I think one of the things that's been really neat about this time period is that kids have such easy access to the things around them that are really important to them. So being able to show off pets or bring in a sibling to, <laughs> to do, say or do whatever, or just whatever things around their house, that kind of show and tell time with that can be kind of a distraction in a regular classroom, but in terms of just making those connections, it's really important. But if a kid's able to record themselves um, doing something that they're particularly proud of or particularly good at, that's something that they might be able to do in a Flipgrid's the example that I gave, you know, they could just record themselves and share that out. Whether it's, I know when I was working at elementary school, kids would be like oh i can do i can do cartwheels i can do a round off and of course they'd want to get up and demonstrate that in the classroom it's <laughs> it could quickly become a a uh, fiasco if you've got too many kids trying to show off their gymnastics but they could record that at home and show that off so i think that's something to kind of keep in mind that where kids are at home you can start leveraging leveraging that opportunity Definitely. I dropped the link to past sessions in the chat and I also dropped the link to, um, it's called a Bitmoji Classroom Starter Kit. And I will make sure to um, drop both of those links into our PowerPoint as well so that you, um, you can have access to those and anyone who watches this recorded will have access to them as well. 
Yeah, even so it says ed text, the content in there is totally relevant for, for anyone who's looking for help um, regarding those tools. Um, some of the conversation might at times get specific towards ed text, but there are definitely, um, ma the majority of those are quite general. That was a question and, from Phil in the chat. Yeah, and Jessica was saying about having kids do stuff on Google Slides. So that's another thing is if you had them, you know, make a slideshow about themselves or record themselves on Flipgrid or whatever, they're going to be invested in wanting to share and they're going to learn how to use that tool. So you'll kind of have the benefit of they'll have to get on and kind of spend some time figuring that out. Whereas if you were asking them to demonstrate them your math knowledge using Flipgrid, they might be like, oh, this is this is much harder to use than I thought. Um, so I think that's one of the things to kind of think about. Sometimes to get kids using new tools, it works really nicely if you can give them an opportunity to, you know, make it about themselves or something that they're interested in because they'll be much more engaged with, I want to learn this tool so I can share this information that's important to me. And yes, Eunice, definitely share the, the webinar library. We're yes, trying please. To, trying to get that out as widely as possible. And it's actually one of the things Em and I were talking about this morning is like, what are the best mechanisms for getting this out and sharing it with people? Yes, that page is actually relatively new too. It's only been up for a few days. So if you hadn't seen it before, you're not crazy. It's, it's pretty new. <laughs> Oh yeah, John, can you, um, nope. oh, yeah, Absolutely. I was just saying if you could toss that in there. Um, and I'm going to, I've got one more piece here. Um, the, this will, this slide will be in the slide deck. So just to let you guys know, um, at the end of the slide deck, there is the sequence and schedule for the remote learning 101 and the meeting schedule, um, where you can register. It's on the DOE page. So if you're looking for the quick links for that, those are in that slideshow as well. And the certificate link is in the chat. Awesome. All right, any final questions? I'm hearing crickets, so I'm going to say we're probably good. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. We are going to be having a 3 p.m. session today on Flipgrid and Padlet. If you have questions or want to share something that you're doing in either one of those platforms, feel free to join us at 3. Bye, everyone. Bye. Have a wonderful afternoon.